this room. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's Dr. Nasir Gami. Thank you for joining me for uh, my podcast this week. The topic is serotonin withdrawal syndrome. Uh, and if you like what you hear, please go to our website, psychiatryletter.com, where we have webinars and other free material there as well for you to read uh, or follow us on Substack. So um, serotonin withdrawal syndrome is a topic that has been getting some increasing attention in the media recently. There was a big story in National Public Radio on it uh, a week or two ago, and it was describing how a lot of people in the public, uh, patients who've taken serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SRIs, uh, are talking about having withdrawal syndrome symptoms, but it's not being studied much or there hasn't been much research on it in uh, the clinical or scientific literature. So I want to talk about it, about it this uh, week. Um, in general, it's hard to study something like uh, serotonin withdrawal syndrome because the idea is that this is an effect that happens when you stay on SRIs for a long time and then you stop them. And uh, studying things that take years to happen in randomized placebo-controlled trials is very difficult, if not impossible. And so we don't have that kind of research. Instead, what we can have is observational evidence. That is, people just observe, clinicians and patients, what happens over years, and they describe it. And that is useful and necessary, especially for long-term side effects. Uh, it does have the disadvantage of not being definitive because when you're just observing something, there are many different reasons why it may be happening that you may not be aware of. And so you have to be careful about those observations. But nonetheless, that's just the way it is for long-term harms or side effects of almost any drug. Now, in the case of SRI, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, these drugs have been around for over three decades. So we have many years of experience with them. Most of the randomized clinical research is only about one year long at most or less. In fact, the vast majority of studies are only about eight weeks long. So those randomized trials really don't tell us much, if anything, about withdrawal effects, especially if those withdrawal effects happen one year or longer after you take the medication. And in fact, that's my clinical impression that withdrawal symptoms happen with SRIs after people have been on them for about a year or longer. Um, obviously, if it's two years, five years, or a decade or more, it's much more likely. But it seems that it often does not happen in people who are on SRIs only for a few months or six months or less than a year. So my own clinical impression is that one year is the timeline to be aware of, although we'll have to see if research shows that it's exactly that amount of time or, or more or less. But what I tell patients is when we start an SRI, that if you stay on it for longer than a year, you may have difficulty coming off. You may have withdrawal symptoms coming off. Now, what are these withdrawal symptoms? Well, they can range from physical symptoms, like a flu-like syndrome, or um, just generally feeling ill or headaches, to more specific physical symptoms that people often describe, uh, like so-called brain zaps, or a lightning bolt sensation in the body. That's very common. Um, or people can have just a shakiness, tremors, or a general feeling of anxiety and shakiness that is very similar to a panic attack. So part of the withdrawal syndrome of SRIs can be panic attack-like symptoms. <clears throat> now, the other interesting aspect is beside these physical symptoms, people can have psychological ones including anxiety, as we mentioned, but also depression. So sometimes what happens is you stop the SRI and the person has a depressive period. It may last a few days, a few weeks, even a few months. It could be a full-blown depressive episode, which then raises the dilemma, is the depressive episode that happened after stopping the SRI a withdrawal effect from staying on the SRI too long, or is it a benefit of being on the SRI, and once you stop it, they get depressed again. My, my clinical hunch is that it's more of a withdrawal effect, because when you have benefit for the treatment of depression with any drug, you don't tend to get depressed immediately upon stopping it. Usually your body's in a state of remission, so you may go three months, six months, or a year or longer before you have another depressive episode that's a natural depressive episode. 
But if your body goes into an immediate period of depression within days or weeks of stopping a medication, to me, that feels more like a withdrawal effect rather than a natural new episode. Uh, but that's to be established and not definitively known either. But as a summary then, with SRI withdrawal, you can get a range of physical symptoms, classic lightning bolt sensations, brain zaps, or a flu-like syndrome, or you can get psychological symptoms, anxiety, panic attack-like symptoms, or even immediate depressive symptoms. Now, how often does this happen? That's a good question. There is no uh, real answer based on any data yet because there haven't been studies following patients long enough and having both a numerator who has withdrawal symptoms and a denominator who doesn't to give you a percentage. So we really don't know. Um, now, if I'm asked to guess based on my clinical experience, having seen lots of patients on SRIs, I've seen withdrawal symptoms or heard my patients describe withdrawal symptoms when they've tried to stop it in their histories very frequently. So I would say it's not infrequent. So I wouldn't say it's less than 10% of people. I also wouldn't say it's everybody. So I wouldn't say it's 90% of people. But my guess is somewhere in the middle, 50% is probably a good guess. It might be a third. It might be a little more than 50%. But I would guess about one third to one half of people, if they stay on SRIs long enough, more than a year, will have some withdrawal symptoms. Now, some of times it's mild. It's not very severe. You get a few days to a few weeks of brain zaps, it goes away, you're fine. Uh, sometimes it's more severe and patients often are unable to get off the medication. They have to go back on. Um, a larger question is, is it always temporary transient or can it ever be permanent? And the answer to that again is we don't know because there aren't the kinds of studies to give us numbers. However, people have reported in these online sites and just anecdotally that they felt that they've had long-term withdrawal symptoms from SRIs. Again, it's not 90% of people. And it's my clinical experience, it's not 50% of people. It's a small percentage of people. I would guess you know, less than 10% for sure, is my guess, but we'd have to see clinical research again to give us numbers. But it is relatively uncommon for someone to have these kinds of withdrawal symptoms permanently and they don't get better. Although I have uh, seen a uh, few patients who've had that experience or said they have had that experience. Now, <clears throat> what do you do about SRI withdrawal sy uh, syndromes? Is there a way to treat it? Is there a way to prevent it? Well, the best way to prevent it is not to take the medications for longer than a year if you don't have to. And I think that's an important point and actually would take care of most cases because SRIs have been proven effective for treatment of depressive symptoms for eight weeks. They've been shown that if you have current symptoms over eight weeks, you can get those symptoms better. Uh, as we've discussed in the past, and that's what we'll keep discussing because it's highly underappreciated, SRIs have not been really shown to have long-term benefit over years in prevention of depressive episodes in unipolar depression or standard uh, severe recurrent depression. People say they have been. The FDA has approved them for long-term treatment. There are maintenance studies that claim they're effective. But when you look at these studies, after six months, the benefit with SRIs is no better than placebo. So they haven't been shown to have long-term benefits after six months. So in my view, there isn't a real reason to be on these medications for one year, two years, five years, 10 years, at least not for depression. Now, one might argue there are other reasons one might use them. For instance, if someone has obsessive compulsive disorder and it's very severe and it responds to SRIs, it's a long-term chronic disease it does benefit from SRIs long-term. That would be a scenario one might use them long-term. But even there, there are other alternatives. Dopamine blockers have been shown effective for OCD. Uh, even mood stabilizers can be effective for OCD. A lot of times OCD is incorrectly diagnosed when a person instead has a mood illness that's causing the OCD symptoms rather than pure OCD. And then if you treat the mood illness, you don't need to treat the OCD. The OCD goes away when the mood illness gets better. And that's where mood stabilizers, for instance, for bipolar illness or for mood temperaments like cyclothymia and hyperthymia, often get rid of the OC, apparent OCD, which isn't real OCD because it's secondary to the mood illness. All that being said, in cases where there is pure chronic OCD, there may be benefits and reasons to use SRIs long term. But not, I think, as much as is currently the practice where SRIs are used long term 
in uh, the vast majority of people who get them. I don't think that there's research evidence to support that, no, is there, nor is there a reason to um, continue the agents that way. If we don't continue the agents long-term, then we don't run into the withdrawal symptom problem at all. Uh, so that's a, um, a benefit. So uh, I got a comment on the chat from Daniel Herringer. Are there benefits in preventing mood episodes with Ethorize long-term? As I said, no, they've been shown not to be effective after six months. They do not prevent mood episodes after six months, which is the time frame where you would see prevention. All their benefit in the first six months is just for current mood symptoms, not for prevention of new episodes. So these are really short-term drugs. They should be used short-term. They should be used for six months or less. They should not be routinely used for six years or more, as is currently the case. That would be my view. But let's talk about all these patients who are on these SRIs and they are having the withdrawal symptoms. How can you get them off? Can you get them off? In my experience, it's very hard to get them off by just tapering straight down on the SRI, no matter how slowly you go. It's especially difficult with the worst ones, the ones that have the shortest half-lives and that are also noradrenergic, appear to have the most serotonin withdrawal syndrome. Those would be drugs like venlafaxine, which is notorious, duloxetine, which is horrendous, uh, and, uh, may, and those two probably would be the worst. Uh, but the other ones like sertraline and others also cause serotonin withdrawal syndrome. The one that causes it the least is uh, fluoxetine or Prozac because it has a very long half-life. The half-life of Prozac is a week to three weeks, including the active metabolite. So you can taper off a of Prozac or stop it altogether, but it will stay in your system for weeks on end. And that's good in terms of re reducing withdrawal symptom risk. So what I do with patients routinely who are on SRIs for at least a year or longer, definitely if it's been a few years or longer, I just cross taper them to Prozac. I start Prozac and then I taper them off the SRI and then I leave them on the Prozac and then I taper them down on the Prozac. I can show you briefly how to do that to give you a sense of how you would dose this. Uh, if um, Elio, we can pull up the slide that I want to show. So here's my little protocol. Suppose you have somebody on 225 milligrams of venlafaxine, which is definitely, they've been on it for a couple of years. That's going to cause withdrawal symptoms. It's going to be horrendous. There's no way to directly come off that drug. But what you can do is begin, uh, is to decrease it a little bit. You can go from 225 to 150. That usually is well tolerated. They still have plenty of medication in their system. They're not going to have withdrawal symptoms from that. Wait a few weeks and then add your fluoxetine, 10 milligrams a day, at the same time as you decrease the venlafaxine to 75 milligrams a day. And then you increase your fluoxetine to 20 milligrams a day when you come off of the venlafaxine altogether. You also could just add the 10 milligrams of fluoxetine earlier at say 150 milligrams or even 225, and then taper down and increase the fluoxetine as you're tapering down on the venlafaxine. Um, then you stay on the fluoxetine, you're on 20 milligrams for one to two months. Maybe you take it down to 10 milligrams then and stay on that for one to two months. Then maybe take it to 10 milligrams every other day for one to two months. You notice you take up to six months or longer to taper off and then stop it. And when you do it this way, you can get people off the venlafaxine without any withdrawal symptoms because they're covered by the fluoxetine that they're taking. And then you can taper off the fluoxetine over three to six months without a problem and then people are able to get off the SRI. So that's the solution to getting people off SRIs and dealing with serotonin withdrawal syndrome. And um, as I said, the, the better solution is really to avoid long-term treatment when it's not necessary, which would be in the majority of people actually. So let me see if we have some questions and comments coming in. That's basically what I wanted to say. And uh, we can take a few minutes if there are questions and comments to uh, answer them before we stop for today. Here's one question. Uh, why do so many doctors keep patients on SRIs for so many years if the maintenance studies show low efficacy? And the answer is that most people don't realize, most doctors, including experts, don't know that the maintenance studies show low efficacy. They don't realize what I just told you, that after six months, there's no benefit. This is very rarely discussed, uh, basically ignored. And the fact that I'm bringing it to your attention is, is a novel thing. Don't assume that what I'm saying is just routinely said. Actually, it's not said. 
And so, you know, you have the maintenance studies, they show benefit over placebo. The FDA approves it based on those studies. And so doctors prescribe it. That's rational. The problem is when you look into the maintenance study more carefully, you realize the benefit's not there after six months. And, um, you know, the benefit over placebo was just predetermined at whatever time frame. So they didn't say it has to be longer than six months. It could be two months or three months after the study starts. It's just better than placebo. And that's all they claimed. And that's what they showed. But I think that the um, indication for maintenance treatment is misleading because doctors assume that it means that the patients will do well for years. And in fact, it only means the patients will do well for a few months. And in fact, they don't do better than a nothing placebo after six months. So they, they won't do well for years. Actually, the studies show that they won't do well, but they're misinterpreted as if they're just doing well because they're interpreted simplistically um, and, and uh, not in a more nuanced way looking at the actual data. So um, that's my response to that good question. Um, don't know if there are any other questions or comments from the audience, um, but I think we've gone about the, thank you for putting me back on. We've gone the 15 minutes or so for our podcast. So I wanna thank you again for joining us again. If you wanna learn more about this and other ideas related to this, please go to our website, psychiatryletter.com where we have plenty of free material, our Substack blog, where we have plenty of posts that are free and available to you. And we have uh, paid webinars where we have courses, where we have five to 10 lectures and go into this material in much more detail. Thanks again for joining me on my podcast. I'm Dr. Mr. Gami. I'll see you next time.